On behalf of CADV Board of Directors, Executive Director, Staff, and Volunteers, this year's client documentary tells the story of a smart, young, and purposeful woman who had a vision for her life and marriage. Her vision was quickly shattered, putting her on a path she had not expected and was not prepared for. Domestic violence has many faces. We hear about the situations where physical abuse is prominent, and those are often difficult stories to hear and see. And a few years ago, we witnessed the tragic journey of Amanda Kessler, who was stalked by her abuser and ultimately murdered for taking a stand against violence. Emotional, verbal, and psychological abuse, as you will see in Morgan's case, can be just as traumatic as physical abuse. Morgan's ex-husband used tactics such as isolation, moving her away from her network of support, threats, and rage to successfully maintain control of her. In fact, she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder due to the abuse she suffered at the hand of her ex-husband. Just to give you an idea of the impact on a person's life with PTSD, here are some of the common symptoms. Having nightmares or flashbacks, making it feel like it's happening again, feeling emotionally cut off from others, feeling numb or losing interest in things you used to care for, feeling constantly on guard, feeling irritated, having difficulty sleeping, having trouble concentrating. These are just some of the symptoms. Imagine trying to navigate a domestic violence relationship with a new baby, fighting legally, being cross-examined, being court-ordered into co-parenting therapy sessions with your abusive ex-husband. The courage it took for Morgan to take a stand against violence when she in fact feared for her life and her son's life is truly amazing. Let's listen to her incredible journey. So growing up, I grew up in an amazing family. I have three sisters, um, amazing and supportive parents. Um, really could not have asked for a better childhood. I would say that our family was really rooted in just strong values. Um, I would say my parents had a very mutual and respectful, loving marriage. Um, and I witnessed that as I grew up. I really looked up to them for the ways that they loved each other well. Um, I would also say they were always very honest with each other and with our family even, and even with family friends. Um, and I didn't know that later on in life that would probably save my life, um, just seeing that that's what a good marriage looks like. I hadn't dated much in high school. Um, we went to an all-girls Catholic high school, and um, really the message of that high school was empowering women, um, that girls can do anything they set their minds to. I just really was highly involved in high school and you know didn't date a whole lot. Um, when I got to college, I met um, someone that we were kind of a part of the same friend group for um, probably about a year. And that's originally how I had gotten to know him. He was probably one of the more outgoing people in the group. Um, definitely the life of the party, very charismatic. Um, yeah, I just a very kind of outgoing personality, um, I would say. Um, the person probably that was one of the star of the show at different, you know, college parties, could make everyone laugh, um, but also seen at church every Sunday and came from a very prominent Catholic family. Um, and we were good friends for a while. And then, you know, I found out that he was interested in me and he asked me out on a date. And honestly, in the time, I was taken aback, like, wow, he's interested in me and this is amazing. He's he just seemed like such an incredible guy. He seemed so friendly and um, kind of just larger than life. He's funny, he, you know, loves his faith. I've always loved my faith. Um, so all of those qualities, I was like, wow, he's really interested in me, this is great. Um, and so he asked me out on a date our sophomore year of college. And I remember that first date, him asking me after we had had dinner and we were just kind of talking after dinner and him asking me, you know, out of the three virtues of faith, hope, and love, which is your favorite, you know, and this is my favorite, and these are all the reasons why, and he just was very, um, he seemed to be very into his faith and very 
um, grounded, which were things I was looking for, you know, for several months there, even as we started to date then, um, in a, you know, committed relationship, it seemed to be great. You know, he seemed to treat me well, and um, I really enjoyed being with him. He was funny. Um, a lot of people really liked him. Um, and so I just remember the beginning of our relationship just thinking, wow, this guy really is amazing. He's everything I ever hoped for. He proposed to me our senior year of college and in a way that I thought this is everything I'd ever dreamed of. I mean, it just was seemed like just the perfect day. It was the day before we graduated college. So all of our friends and family were there and it just seemed so thoughtful and um, Again, just really everything felt like, wow, he's just this amazing guy. So then we were engaged for about a year and um, we got married in May of 2017. And again, I mean, the wedding was everything I'd ever hoped for. Um, it was just felt like a dreamy day. Um, looking back now, even just in our relationship and leading up to our wedding, I, you know, with all kind of the therapy and the work that I've done, I can see a lot of red flags now. Um, but in the time, you know, different things that would come up or happen, I just remember thinking, no one's perfect, you know, and everyone has their faults and I just would look past them. Um, now I wish I would have looked at those a little bit closer, but, you know, because of how charming he was, I look past a lot of that. Um, so there definitely were red flags along the time of our dating experience and even right up until the night before our wedding. One of the red flags, we had been dating for about a year and he had said, you know, we were starting to get a little bit more serious and both told each other we loved each other and he had said he had never dis discerned what his vocation was supposed to be in life, whether he was supposed to become a priest or to be married. And so he was getting ready to start to go study abroad in Italy. And we both had agreed that would be a great time for him to discern because he would have several months, we'd be away from each other. He could use that time to pray and, you know, discern what he wanted, you know, to do in life, what he was called to do. And so we had agreed, we'll take a break in our relationship because if you are called to marriage, we think probably we would marry each other. But if not, you know, then that's what your calling is. And so we'll just take a break in our relationship. We didn't break up, we just said, and I just agreed, you know, I'll, I'll give you some space and just let you have that time to pray about what you want to do in your life. And so we did, and I found out probably a month or two into it, we hadn't really been communicating to allow him that time to discern. Um, I found from someone else that he had been partying and drinking, smoking, hooking up with another girl in Italy. And I was just devastated. I mean, just crushed. I felt betrayed. You know, this was completely different than what he had told me he was going to be doing. And let alone with another girl, you know, and I was waiting for him to come back. You know, I confronted him about it. He came back. Then after he was done studying abroad and we talked about it, he, you know, had tears and said he was so sorry. And, you know, he doesn't know why, why he did that. And um, again, he was very, very good with words. Um, you know, and in the moment, you know, I was caught between, I think he's the love of my life. He seems like this great guy, but I feel betrayed and really hurt and definitely a, um, trust had been broken through that act. Um, and so, you know, again, you're just weighing, do you forgive them? Everyone makes mistakes. Or do you take this as a red flag and say, no, that's not okay and break up with him over that? And then I remember our senior year, we were, we had already looked at engagement rings and kind of had talked about engagement pretty seriously. And we had gone, he had been mentioning to me for weeks that he hadn't been able to see his, get in to see his spiritual director and how frustrated he was. And so we had gone to church one Sunday morning and we we're walking out of church and we saw a spiritual director. And so, you know, I said hi to him and, you know, it was like, oh, he's been wanting to get together with you for some time. And and he shot me a look and, you know, just a horrible look and kind of was caught off back because he had been telling me he had been wanting to get together with the spiritual director. And the spiritual director was like, oh, yeah, you know, we can find time. And 
Um, anyways, after that, we got into the car and he lit into me, just started screaming at me. I can't believe that you would make me look so ridiculous. Um, why did you say that in front of him? You, you know, it was all about how he looked in the moment that he felt that, you know, and I was caught off guard because I was like, I was just trying to help. You know, you had been saying that you had been wanting this. I didn't think that was a big deal, but he was screaming so loudly and so much at me that I just started crying and was like, if you ever yell at me again, we will not get married. I am not going to marry someone like this. And so then, of course, immediately he started apologizing and said, I don't know why I did that. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, I know you were trying to help. And looking back now, that was something that then he, that was his true self. And, um, um, but in the moment, again, you just think no one's perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. Maybe he was tired or, you know, you just think, well, forgive him, you know, if it, if it happens again. But then it never did. He, um, we were long distance during our engagement, um, so I didn't see a lot of the day-to-day -day life that he was living. Um, so it was much easier for him to hide as well, kind of his true self during that time. Um, and then the night before our wedding, we were at our rehearsal in the church, and the night before that, he had been out late drinking and, um, and everything with several of the bridal party, and so he was, tired the next day, the day of our rehearsal, and he was telling me the at our rehearsal that he was wanting to go out and drink and party with everyone and go to the bars. And I had just said, you know, I really think that's probably not a good idea. We're getting married tomorrow. It's a sacrament. You know, I just don't think I would rather you not go out and drink a lot and tonight before our wedding. And so then immediately he just started screaming at me in the church. I mean, very loudly. Um, and my sister was like, you know, you need to listen to her. She's about to be your wife. You need to listen if she's asking you to, you know, not drink heavily the night before your wedding, you need to listen to her. And so then he started yelling at her. And I remember just thinking, you know, what the heck? And talking to him on the way to our rehearsal dinner, like, what was that about? You know, you need to apologize to her. And that was not okay. And I, he never did. And, um, Again, but you know, it's the night before your wedding, what are you gonna do? You know, I felt like that was really weird that you behave that way, but you know, you kind of just, I just glazed over it. Like, well, maybe he's stressed, maybe he's tired, you know, about to get married, there's a lot of nerves, maybe just kind of make a lot of excuses for the behavior. And um, again, think everyone, everyone makes mistakes and you know, wanting to be forgiving as well. I think I had just hoped for a happy marriage, you know, just a marriage with, um, to be able to do life with this person that, you know, he really felt like he was my person. I knew marriage wouldn't be perfect and I knew life isn't perfect. Um, even just growing up, my parents, you know, talked openly about struggles. We were a really close family growing up. So I, I don't think I had an idealistic view of marriage. Well, I remember even on our honeymoon, he just seemed off. I mean, it was almost immediately after the wedding band went on, but I couldn't quite pinpoint it. Before the marriage, it seemed like he loved me so well. Like he supported me. He knew I wanted, I was a nurse. I went to nursing school and worked really hard. It seemed like he supported that. It just seemed like a really mutual supportive relationship before we got married. And then after that really changed from the day to day, I mean, quickly it became that his job was the focus. And even though I was pregnant and working almost full time, I was expected to be at most of his work events. I always knew that I wanted to be a mom and I loved the idea of being a young mom. We got pregnant right away and that was planned. That was what I had always wanted was to be a young mom and to be a mom. Um, but later I would find that that would be a way that he would further control me um, and isolate me through that. Our hours were much different that we were working. He was working with college students, so he would plan a lot of Bible studies late, late into the evening or, you know, kind of had a co more college schedule. And I was working as a nurse, um, so I would have a lot of early mornings. Um, and I remember one, one day just saying to him, you know, I, I feels like we haven't even had a date night in, a, you know, months. That was enough to set him off. So 
He started screaming at me. So then the next morning, I said, you know, I'd really like to finish talking this through and like, can we just find a time to be able to spend time together? And so then he started screaming at me that morning and we were planning to go um, for his work to be a part of a tailgate at a football game that day. It was a Saturday. And, you know, so he started getting ready to go. And, you know, I said, I really would like to be able to finish talking through this, you know, and resolve this because he had been screaming and just, you know, very, very angry. Um, and he said, no, I'm going to the tailgate. You know, we were both planning to go, but he was like, I'm going. And when I go, you know, you better not be here when I get back. And, you know, I just remember kind of thinking like, what? You know, I don't know. We didn't know really. I didn't know really anyone else besides his coworkers and a few of my coworkers in, in Columbia. I, I remember thinking, where would I go? What kind of... But he kept repeating it and screaming it at me. You better not be here when I get back. Um, just very volatile, volatile body language, volatile eyes, just very kind of domineering. He's taller than me, domineering over me, yelling that repeatedly at me. And I remember asking him, like, you don't mean that. What do you mean? You know, where would I go? Where do you want me to go if I'm not here when you get back from this tailgate? You know, I don't care. You better not be here when I get back, just screaming. And I remember I was shaking, you know, just like, what did the, what just happened? You know, all I said was that I wanted more time together and that led to this and what happened here and who is this, you know? This is not, the man I married is not the man I'm married to. And feeling just very fearful, like quickly realizing, well, what happens if I am here when he gets back? Um, especially because of his body language and it really felt like a real threat. And I, I really, truly thought he would just come back and say, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me. That was horrible of me to say. You know, I don't know, you know, you're pregnant and I shouldn't treat you like that. Or, you know, I just really thought he would, but he never did. I waited about an hour or two and he never came back. And so then I thought, okay, well, if he's not going to come back, I don't want to be here when he gets back tonight after he had been drinking. And I don't know what he would do. I called my sister who lives lived in St. Louis at the time and asked her if I could. I mean, I'm just sobbing. I'm like, I don't know what, what had happened. And, you know, I need to leave. And can I come stay with you tonight? Of course, she said, yes, come stay with me tonight. And, you know, she didn't ask much about what had happened. Um, and I kind of had some sense that I probably shouldn't say everything that had happened. I don't know. Um, so we stayed there that night and um, he called around midnight, just calling, calling, calling me and, you know, saying, I'm going to call the police if you don't tell me exactly where you are. Um, so finally I said, you know, I'm in St. Louis visiting my sister and, you know, I'll probably be back tomorrow. My sisters had found out then that I was with her and I think they were all kind of wondering what had happened. And I said, please don't tell mom and dad, just whatever you do, don't tell mom and dad. It had been a theme kind of the last, the months even leading up to that, that he would have these outbursts and so much so that they would make me very fearful. And so at that point I said, you need help. You know, this is, I can't, I'm pregnant. I cannot keep leaving like this. You can't do this, so you need help. And he, you know, is tearful. You know, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And of course I will, I'll meet with the priest today. To add to it, he was a missionary at the time. You know, so again, you just, it just was so surprising because you think this person is, trying to teach others how to be a good person and how to live with values and a Christian life. And so it was just a very um, confusing situation to be in because on the outside, the life he was presenting to everyone around us was, you know, of good morals. And he was teaching, trying to supposedly teach college students this and how to be a good man. But I knew behind closed doors, this is not what's happening. So I had met with my spiritual director that morning in St. Louis and told him and kind of what had happened. And he said, this is not a normal marriage. You know, he needs help. And um, so anyways, but he was sorry. And so I came back and I wanted to resolve things. I didn't want it to be a tumultuous relationship or there to be any conflict. I wanted to forgive and I wanted to believe that he was the man that I thought I married. I wanted to believe that. But right when I had returned, he said, you didn't tell your parents, did you? And I said, 
no, I don't think my sisters told my parents. You know, my sisters did find out though. And immediately he was like, you told your sisters? You know, and like, well, I had to stay with Amanda and then they found out as well. And um, so that he really shamed me for, like, you shouldn't have even told them. Why did you tell them what happened? And I said, well, I didn't really give them any details. You know, so again, I was very defensive and felt like, oh man, I shouldn't have told them. And um, he really had kind of the isolating down, um, making sure that I wasn't telling anyone what was happening, making me feel guilty if I did. Um, so I remember texting my sisters and saying, do not tell mom and dad, you know, because he had said that to me and made that very clear, you know, do not tell your parents what happened. We were very unaware of what was going on early on. Um, everything seemed to be pretty straightforward, like a normal relationship. And it's only now in looking back where we see, you know, what I would term maybe bumps in the road. You know, at the time it was doesn't didn't seem to be anything too alarming to where we would want Morgan to, you know, end the relationship or anything like that. So, uh, you know, you you say, well, those are just little things. You know, we'll we'll just deal with that, or or you know, we can we can handle that. I mean, it's just a bunch of little things. It's not one big thing, you know, in a relationship. Um, so looking back, it, obviously hindsight's 2020, but in the midst of their dating, which they dated quite a while, um, it didn't seem like a real big deal at the time. We raised our girls to be, you know, uh, smart about um, date rape or sexual assault or making good choices. None of our kids were partiers. None of them, you know, were drinkers or did drugs or any of those things. So. I guess we had this idea that when your kids make all the right choices, that things work out for them. And we didn't have any idea that the things that we were seeing, lies or uh, some of the controlling uh, behavior or the starting to see things, um, her being pulled away from us, none of that um, came to like be an alarming or red flag for us. Um, we didn't know enough about domestic violence to really know what was happening. We had planned to go be with his family for Thanksgiving week and with his job he had had the whole week off so um, we had planned to drive from Columbia to Denver and we did and I remember as we were pulling out of Columbia bringing up something like finances um, and just wanting to talk about our financial situation and and I that was what triggered him. He started just becoming very volatile again in the car, um, just screaming at me, and it, that escalated as we kept driving um, to then eventually he said, I just have half the mind to drop you off on the side of the road. And I remember looking at him at this point, you know, it's November, and um, I knew I was due in February, so I was very far along. And um, looking at him like, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere. I mean, in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, on our way to Colorado. Every time he would do this, it it was like he had no expression, no emotion, no empathy, um, very cold. And um, so again, I would just start shaking. A lot of times I'd start crying, like, what? You know, and I would try to reason with him, but there was no reasoning. There was no, um, no emotion or reasoning. Um, so he just kept repeating it, saying, I'm, I'm just going to drop you off here. I'm just going to drop you off right here on the side of the road. And at a very, he was yelling it. And uh, again, his body expression was very threatening. Um, and I didn't know if he was serious or not or what would happen then. I mean, I'm very far along, very pregnant. We're in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what I would do, you know, just feeling very vulnerable. I kept trying to reason with him and de-escalate him, but nothing worked. So finally I said, well, if you're going to, please at least drop me off at like a grocery store or at a gas station where I can wait safely and I'll call my parents to have them come. So then he pulls over on the next exit and pulls probably about a mile off the exit to a grocery store and starts, you know, getting my bags out. And I said, I'm going to go to the bathroom and then come out and get my bags. And so I did and I came back out and I said, I think you should call my dad and tell him to come pick me up and what you're doing. 
and then immediately it just switched. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know, it's almost like a different person would come out. Just, oh, I should have never said that. I don't know. Please don't call your parents. Please, you know, I'm, I'm just so sorry. I don't know what came over me. Please get in the car. Please, just get in the car. What do you do? Do you, do you get back in the car with this man that's terrifying? Or do you wait in the middle of nowhere as a very pregnant woman with no one around and at, ask for my family to drive hours to come pick me up. So I did, I got back in the car and um, you know, we pulled over at a McDonald's at one point and I said, you know, I'd really like just a Sprite. I was feeling just kind of sick from the drive. And so he did, he got a Sprite and just went in to kind of set it on the cup holder and drove right past the McDonald's, rolled his window back down, picked up the Sprite and as he's yelling at me, just chucked it out the window. I mean, violently. The whole thing just happened so fast where, you know, it was like, oh, here's your Sprite. Nope, I have it, and I'm gonna throw it out the window and make you know who's in charge and who's in control. You know, and it was just things like that where it didn't always have to be that he was, you know, just that trip alone. Like, it was very terrifying him drop, you know, threatening to drop me off on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it, even just small acts like that of throwing the Sprite out the window as he's you know, very violently yelling at me and, you know, out of control in the car and he's driving, you know, that made me very fearful of him. So we made it to Colorado finally and that night and we go in to see his family and he had acted like nothing happened that day. Like, you know, it's great, we're all doing great. Here's my pregnant wife to show off to everyone. And, you know, um, in front of everyone, probably in front of 15 of his family members, he goes, oh, you know, Morgan, can I rub your feet? I'd love to give you a foot rub. I bet your feet are exhausted after this trip. And, you know, again, I was caught in a moment of, what the heck is happening? Like, this is not how today has gone. You know, and he's wanting to show in front of everyone, as he did even as a missionary. You know, he would kick me out, and then the next day we'd be at Bible study, and he'd be, you know, trying to teach everyone how to be a good man when he had just kicked me out the day before. Or there was a lot of that, that it was like two different people showing up all the time. It was in front of everyone that he offered. And so I remember saying, sure, you know, that'd be great. And he did, you know, in front of everyone. Everyone was complimenting him like, wow, you're so amazing. And, you know, what a great husband you are. And I just remember thinking this is so not authentic. This isn't true. This isn't the reality that we're living. You know, today I almost got dropped off in the middle of Kansas. So I had really hoped, I mean, this whole time, you know, I had really hoped that once the baby was born, things would change. He would finally get help. I thought, you know, once he sees this baby, I still in my heart of hearts believe that he was the person that I married. You know, I still believed he could be good and wanted, wanted him to be that so badly. And he had been saying like, you know, I know I need to get help. And he had been admitting it. So it felt like, okay, he knew he needed help. Um, I mean, he had even, we had a conversation with my spiritual director and he admitted it to him. You know, I know I need help. I know I'm the problem. I know I have anger issues and all these things. So I thought, okay, once the baby's born, you can't just kick me out because there's a baby, you know, and we're gonna be a family. and. Charlie was born in February of 2018, and um, Charlie was the biggest blessing, uh, is the biggest blessing of my life. Once Charlie was born, I really, because of him, woke up to the abuse. Um, all of a sudden, things that I had allowed myself to experience, and I had allowed myself to be treated in certain ways by his dad, all of a sudden, when Charlie was born, it was like, oh no. I am not gonna let that happen to this baby. So my mom had agreed to come stay with us. We had planned it out in advance months before that she would stay with us um, the first week of his life, come to Columbia and help cook for us and just help take care of him. And I remember the first night we got home from the hospital, it was either the first or second night we were home from the hospital. You know, his dad just hadn't been in a good way since Charlie was born. And it was just a lot about him. like. He was asking the nurses in the hospital to get him coffee. He was, you know, a lot of it was him. He was tired, even though I had gone through 30 hours of labor. He was, you know, all these things. So 
We get home from the hospital and I was like, you know, what's wrong? Like, you seem really angry and just like, you know, we have this beautiful boy now and what's the matter? Well, you're not loving me well. You haven't been loving me well. I don't know what more I can possibly give you right now. I'm doing everything I can and just kind of crying. Like, I can't do any more for you than I'm doing. I'm doing everything I can. Well, you're just not loving me well. You're not loving me well. You're not taking care of me. And it just, and that was a theme. Just, it was all about him. Um, very, nothing was ever enough. It just was, nothing ever probably would have been enough. One of the nights um, that my mom was with us, um, she had heard Charlie's dad pressuring me into making a decision that night. I think Charlie was three or four days old. Um, she had heard his dad pressuring me to make the decision that day whether or not we were going to be moving to Denver. And, you know, I had been trying to reason with him, like, we just have a newborn. We can't make a decision in a day. We do. We do. We need to make this decision today, just badgering me and twisting my words. And prior to that, he had told all of our family about the month before that we were moving to Omaha, where my family was. And he had talked to family friends, getting jobs lined up, had told our friends that he was moving to Omaha um, and that that was our plan. And, you know, so my mom kind of said, like, you know, I thought you had talked to our family and friends that you were moving, you guys were moving to Omaha, but, you know, now you're not. And she just said, I just want to make sure that you're, like, your words are lining up with your intentions. And that was enough. So then he started yelling at my mom in the kitchen, screaming at her. Again, violent, like, volatile eyes. He was taller than her, domineering over her, wild face, very threatening body language. Get the hell out of my house, screaming at her. You know, my mom is, she's worked with mental health for her whole life. Um, so she knows how to de-escalate a situation, and, but she was shaking because of his body language and behavior. You know, and thankfully she was able to kind of de-escalate him a little bit, but um, he was just volatile that week towards her, towards me. Um, and so I think that was the first time that she really was clued in. You know, we had at that point been married almost a year, but I think her living with us that long was the first time she was clued in like something's not right. This is not, this doesn't all add up. Something is not right. We became aware uh, when they had a, a baby and I went to uh, be with them after the baby was born. I witnessed him abuse, being abusive of her. And um, it was so out of context. Um, I really didn't know what we were even looking at. And I remember saying to Morgan, honey, what is going on? And she said, mom, the man I married is not who I'm married to. Um, and I said, how long has this been going on? And she said, since we got married, pretty much. And it was the beginning of starting to understand uh, what domestic violence is. But I'll tell you, um, you know, we, we um, still didn't really know. On Monday morning, I came to him and said, so it's just the two of us and Charlie there. I said, look. My mom has been basically my only support this week with Charlie, and I really need you to mellow out. You need to calm down. You know, you can't be volatile like this. We have a newborn. He can't be around this. And um, and I just said, if you can't, like maybe we need to go stay with my family for a little bit so that um, you can get help because he Charlie can't be in this environment. And so then he looked very coldly at me like he had done many times, no emotion, and said, okay, well, I'll pack your bags then, and I'll pack Charlie's too. During that time, uh, his dad took Charlie without me seeing, drove away, wouldn't tell me where they went. Anyways, finally I got Charlie back and in the car, and we just started driving and um, drove all the way to Omaha. Charlie was one week old. I remember my mom saying, Morgan, something's not right, you know, but I'm your mom and I'm probably biased. So you need to go talk to someone. Just go tell someone we need to, you to see a therapist and um, you just need to tell them what's happened. And 
because I just wasn't ready. I think I was still fearful to tell my parents and family because there had been so many times I had been threatened not to. Um, so I still hadn't told them a lot of what had happened the year before. And, um, and I think I knew something wasn't right too. So I did, I went to a therapist and told her almost everything that had happened the year before. And um, she just said, wow, you have been experiencing the cycle of domestic violence for this last year. And here was what it is. And she explained, you know, all the stages of the cycle. And I, I think I was in a little bit of denial, like domestic violence, me, you know, it's just like, what, it really? But also when she showed me the cycle, it was very clear, like, yes. I can't believe that I'm saying that, but yes, this has been exactly what I've been experiencing. Um, we talked about the dynamics of emotional abuse, um, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, um, even financial abuse. He always had kept his own account and all of his checks, paychecks went into his account and all of mine went into our mutual account that both of us had access to. Um, anyways, so we just talked about all the dynamics of abuse and I couldn't believe it, but it was exactly what I had been experiencing. Um, so she had said, don't return without a safety plan and until he agrees to get help. So I went back and we probably had one good day where he was able to go by the safety plan. And the plan that he agreed to basically was just no lying, no manipulating, um, no telling me where I can and can't go, um, no kicking us out, you know, no explosions of anger, I mean, no threatening me. It seemed like very reasonable things. And if you can't abide by it, then you need to leave the house because Charlie and I cannot leave every time. You need to leave until you're ready to abide by our safety plan and you're gonna get help. And so he had agreed to that. But after one day, it went right back to how it was. And he was having to leave several times a day. I had found out um, from people that he was telling everyone that I was had just postpartum depression, that I was crazy. Then he started saying, if you leave the border, cross the border of Missouri again, without my permission, I'm gonna call the cops and I'm gonna charge you with kidnapping our son. So I called the police department and just said, I don't know if this is true or not. I'm just trying to find out whether or not this is true, would I be arrested? And the person, the policeman I talked to, he said, he kind of laughed and he said, what? If he's your son, you can take him, you can take him across state lines to visit family. You won't get arrested, you know? And he's like, what's going on though? Your husband is saying this to you? So he started asking questions and he wanted to open a case file. So, he said, just in case anything escalates, it sounds like this maybe isn't a good situation you're in. And if something escalates, I want to have something on file. What's going on? So that was it. He opened a case file. Well, Charlie's dad found out about it that week. And um, so then it all became that he wanted to clear his name and that became a whole thing. I had come across this email um, of him. He and his dad had put together full of all lies. Just, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, my wife struggling with postpartum depression, and I've just been trying to keep a peaceful home. Um, and I just wanted to clear my name with you guys and that they were gonna be sending to law enforcement. And that was just my tipping point. It was like, man, he cannot keep the safety plan. This isn't safe. He is not an honest person. He's volatile. And I confronted him about it that day and said, what is this? You keep saying that you're gonna be honest, but..." You won't even be honest to law enforcement. You're lying to them. You know the truth, you know? And he just said he wouldn't admit to it. He wouldn't say the truth. And I said, okay, if and you need to leave then if you're not gonna be going by our safety plan. No, I'm not leaving. So then he's not even, you know, with our agreement. So I'm like, well, then I will. Charlie and I cannot be in this situation. Um, so we did, we left, and I didn't know where to go. I was honestly fearful, even though police said they weren't gonna arrest me. If we crossed the state lines, I didn't, you know, I have a three week old baby at this time. How am I gonna drive five hours to Omaha? Um, and then also just worried, like, will he arrest me? I was scared of him. You know, I called my parents and said, where do I go? I don't know what to do. He can't go by the safety plan. 
Again, they didn't know very many details. And my mom just said, well, why don't you go to the police station? And just ask them, what are your options? Can you leave? You know, my parents right away were like, we'll support however we can. And so I did go to the police station with Charlie and the police officer kind of talked to me and said, well, you can go to our domestic violence women's shelter and I'll escort you there. And um, so she did, she escorted us, Charlie and I there. And um, they did their intake and checked us into a room there. Um, and he was about three weeks old at that point. So we stayed in the shelter for, I think it was five nights um, with other women um, and kind of trying to figure out, we met with the head of the shelter and it was the first time I had ever heard the word gaslighting. Um, and the first time I had ever really had it named what I was experiencing. It was like someone finally put a word to what I had been experiencing the last year. Someone finally understood what was happening. Um, and uh, it was heartbreaking because I thought, you know, all this time, well, he was just being human and he was just, you know, making mistakes and saying sorry. But no, it was very intentional. And that was really the first time I learned what was going on and um, knew that I couldn't just go back, uh, that it wasn't safe. And so they kind of helped establish a safety plan moving forward for Charlie and I and what we could do. Um, and we went to go stay with from there with my family in Omaha um, for several months. I remember, I mean, I just never thought that I would be someone that would end up at a shelter. I mean, here I come from this amazing family. I mean, my immediate family and my extended family. I mean, just an absolute incredible family. I mean, I've had the best childhood growing up, um, gone to the best schools. I'm a nurse. I mean, I just, I feel like I'm a put together person my whole life. You know, I've made good choices. I've not taken the easy road on a lot of things. I wasn't a partier. I've never been into any kind of drugs. I, um, not even much of a drinker. I've never been any of that. I've always made good choices, you know, and how am I at a women's domestic violence shelter right now with my three week old baby? I just remember thinking that being at the shelter, like how I thought, you know, which is horrible, but I had a prejudice that women that end up here made bad decisions. You know, they made bad choices in life and they in, almost intentionally got into bad relationships or, you know, I just, I just never thought that coming from such a good background, I would be at this place. It was very humbling and very eye-opening that this can happen to anyone of any background, um, which was, I'm very grateful for that awareness that I have gained. Um, so after that, we really, we did seek legal, you know, advice. We then found out though that he was trying to file for protection orders, um, Charlie's dad, asking for 100% custody of Charlie, saying that I was mentally unstable and that he needed, Charlie needed a protection order. Um, so when we found that out, um, we figured out that we probably needed some legal protection because we couldn't afford for Charlie just to be taken from me overnight. He had been... I think a month old at that point. So we did file for legal separation then at that point. And um, I wasn't ready to file for divorce. We hadn't even been married a year, you know, and I still, again, had just a seed, a seed of thought in me that he was a good person and is, was capable of being the person that I thought I had married. So at that point, then he showed up at my parents' house and begged me not, begged me to drop it and to not file for legal separation. but. We just continued through the court system, essentially. He was granted two weeks of visitation in Omaha um, with Charlie. And since he hadn't really been part of Charlie's life much, he hadn't visited us in Omaha or um, been, you know, really around Charlie much, the judge granted that I could be a part of the visitations as well since Charlie was so little um, and still exclusively breastfed at that point. So I thought I would just maybe go for the first few just to help him acclimate to Charlie and then I would just let them have their time for those two weeks. But they really did not go well, to say the least. Um, it was clear that it was just, Charlie was a tool for manipulation basically for me um, and to try to manipulate me through him. And um, so those were really also traumatic visits with his dad, he was very manipulating. Um, would 
call me names and I would ask him to not call me these names and he would just continue and um, they would videotape me. Um, they would confront me and then videotape me. His dad would threaten me um, with similar behavior that I saw Charlie's dad um, do towards me. His dad would threaten me with wild eyes, red hot face, domineering posture. It was very, very traumatic. I mean, that night was supposed to be an overnight for Charlie with his dad. And my friend had come with me and we had just been there for a few hours with Charlie and she had said she wanted to call 911 several different times throughout the visit just because of how violent it was and volatile. Um, so those visits were horrific. Um, traumatizing for Charlie, traumatizing for me, traumatizing for even friends that I brought with. His dad had filed to um, that jurisdiction should be found in Missouri. Since Charlie was born in Missouri, that that would be where the jurisdiction should be found. Um, and so that's where jurisdiction was. And um, we had our first court date in Columbia in August of 2018. Charlie was um, just a few months old at that point. Hoping that we can we can take this case and move it and move the findings of fact in this case onto other cases to demonstrate that obviously that verbal abuse, emotional abuse is, is abuse and that, that this gentleman was a, was a perpetrator of abuse just, um, just as someone who is physically violent. And that's, that's what this case demonstrated and I was very proud of Morgan throughout and her reaction and the way that she handled herself as, as we went through the case. So over the past few years, I have been involved in um, therapy continuously um, with therapists that specialize in domestic violence. And um, early on, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and just, I've had a lot of those symptoms, even just that, sh um, that were displayed even during exchanges. Um, it was very triggering to even to see Charlie's dad at exchanges, to send Charlie as a newborn alone with my abuser into visitations for 24 hours to days at a time. Um, and then to see Charlie's reactions after the visitations also were very traumatic. You never really are truly free from your abuser if you have a child with them, with the way that the court system is um, established and the way the laws are written. The court proceedings were very terrifying. Um, with his attorney questioning you and downplaying what happened, that was re-traumatizing. Um, and then even just other officials downplaying, you know, whether it be the guardian ad litem or um, social workers that were involved downplaying what was happening, even downplaying Charlie's responses to his dad all felt very re-traumatizing. Another way that the court system would was just re-traumatizing, it was actually an order that we attend co-parenting classes and therapy together. Charlie's dad and I would sit in a room with the therapist, the co-parenting therapist, and um, oftentimes I would be blamed for, you know, not, um, not offering to do certain things with him or not agreeing to for him to come to my house or things like that that um, felt like my own boundaries that I had tried to put up to protect myself and Charlie, um, but those would be questioned and then I would be blamed for them. Um, one of, I remember the co-parenting therapist offering, you know, Charlie at the time had been, you know, inconsolable after visits, begging not to see his dad, saying no the minute he saw him, screaming, going to him. And she said, well, maybe you guys just need to meet in a park together. You and his dad need to just meet with Charlie and Charlie just needs to see you guys together. You need to just have a play date. And I remember thinking, would you have a play date with your abuser? You're not understanding he abused me. And um, that's not safe for me or Charlie. Again, he was so, he is very good with his words and very charming. And um, I think she fell for it a lot, the co-parenting counselor and I worried at times that the judge would fall for it as well, that they would just say, oh, you know, he just is sorry and he's just a normal, you know, guy that's sorry um, and not see really his true colors of who he was. And um, so it would just, 
through the court and through co-parenting, it seemed like both of those were ways he continued to manipulate and um, use the system to further traumatize me and, to be honest, to try to get me back under his control. What I would want to tell anyone else experiencing this kind of abuse or um, in a confusing situation like I was where you're not sure if it's abuse or not, I would just, I would want to tell them to seek help, talk to a counselor, preferably someone who specializes in domestic violence, even if you don't know if that's what it is yet, talk to someone about it and tell them, um, and talk to a trusted family member, maybe even more than one, um, and tell them about what's going on. Um, but specifically a therapist I think would be great to talk to and share what's going on. That's a great place to start. Um, but then start taking steps, whether it is to seek a women's shelter. They have support and resources. Um, they even have legal resources for you and can help you get a safety plan in place. Um, I think for a lot of women, especially even for myself, your first priority is your children. And I think that's why a lot of women stay, but staying for the child doesn't give them any way out either. Doesn't give either you or them a way out. It doesn't give you or them another side of what life looks like, a healthy side, a good and beautiful side. That's all you know and all they would know. Um, and even, you know, our situation is not, is certainly not perfect still um, and certainly difficult. Um, but I would never trade this for the world. I'm so grateful that Charlie knows normalcy now. He knows what it looks like to have a peaceful home. He knows what security and real love looks like, um, especially in his home. He knows the difference, and that will change his life. It will change how he is as a partner someday. It will change everything. It changes his secure attachments that he's been able to form um, in a safe place. Um, if we never would have left, I don't know. I don't know if I would even be here. I don't know what life would look like. And I would just want to encourage anyone that's out there that um, that is there is hope and that um, the first step really is just leaving. Follow your gut because it's probably right. If your gut's saying that things aren't quite right like mine was, if yours is probably right as well, that things probably aren't right. And um, his threats to isolate you, don't give, just don't give them power. Don't give him any more power. Than, um, than he needs and um, don't listen to those and seek help because help is out there and it's gonna take multiple of us speaking up about this for there to be change, um, real change in the future. Just really hope that people will hear the difference your organization makes. Had we not had your help, I have no idea where we would be. I really, um, I hope that people can uh, really understand the difference your organization makes and um, just how critical it is in this battle.